We have first uh, Robert Lightfoot, who is NASA's Associate Administrator, the agency's highest ranking civil servant position. He previously was the director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and he began his NASA career at the Marshall Center in 1989. Uh, next we have Dr. John M. Grunsfeld. He is the Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate. You all probably know him better as the Hubble Repairman. Dr. Grunsfeld joined NASA's astronaut office in 1992, and he's the veteran of five space shuttle flights and visited Hubble three times uh, during these missions. You can follow him on Twitter at AskSciAstro. Next, we have Dr. Michael Gazarek, who is the Associate Administrator for NASA's newest mission directorate, the Space Technology Mission Directorate. Dr. Gazarek has over 25 years of experience in the design, development, and deployment of space flight systems. You can follow NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate at, at NASA Technology on Twitter. And finally, we have William Gerstenmeyer, who's the Associate Administrator for the Human Exploration and Operations Directorate. Previously, he served as the manager of the International Space Station Program. He began his NASA career in 1977 at the then Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming these uh, men to the panel. Okay, well thanks Jen, I appreciate you uh, giving us that introduction and thank you all for being here today. This is a, a pretty exciting day for us. We get to share with you the, the process we've gone through to get to this point with this mission. Um, we really believe we've got a pretty integrated strategy here between the three mission directorates, which is somewhat unprecedented here um, from our perspective of integrating three of our, our top, top line items for the, for the agency. So what I'm going to do is walk through a, an overview here real quick and then I'm going to turn it over to each one of these to share uh, share their perspective on their individual segments as we go. So if I could get the next chart, please. So this is kind of the alignment strategy that we've been looking at. We're talking about three different segments of this, of this mission, and the, and the top piece is the, the identification segment. You can see that we'll spend some time um, between now and 2016 working on identifying, characterizing, and, and choosing a candidate asteroid for us to go, to go capture. The second piece is a, a, a redirect segment. This is a segment that's, that's uh, most notional at this point in that it's, it, it, it's the conceptual piece of where we're headed. This is the part where we'll pull together what Mike Gazarek and his team in space technology are working on for solar electric repulsion, but the capture technique that we'll, that we'll pull together as well to actually go out to get the asteroid and bring it back into translunar space for a stable orbit that we can then go for the last segment, which is the exploration piece of this segment, um, where we'll take SLS and Orion and go visit the asteroid and, and uh, and as early as the 2021 time frame, depending on where we pick, pick an asteroid. So that's kind of how these all line up from a segment perspective and, and these three pieces. Um, we think it's pretty integrated, and, it's, and as you're going to hear from each one of these, this is, this, these are activities we're already doing. These are things that we're already working on, and just being able to integrate them is pretty important. If you go to the next chart, please. So this kind of lays out those three pieces in a, in a pretty simple way. Um, identify. John's going to talk about that. He's going to walk, walk you through what we're doing and what the, the FY14 budget does to, to provide more information on, on the identification part of this. The second segment, of course, is redirect, and, and Mike's going to walk through solar electric propulsion, and, and Gerst is going to walk through some of the capture techniques we're looking at. Um, and then the exploration piece, Gerst will walk through the uh, Orion SLS piece of this, this puzzle as we go forward. So um, we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers, and, and I think I come in at the end and give you the, our path forward to uh, the the mission formulation review that we'll be doing uh, in July. So with that, we'll turn it over to John. Thanks very much, Robert. Uh, of course, being the science guy, uh, the first thing that I want to talk about briefly is, you know, why are we interested in asteroids? Uh, and if we could start the slides. Uh, asteroids are, you know, something that Lori Garver talked about as, as a threat to Earth, but they're actually uh, incredibly interesting from a scientific viewpoint as well. Next slide. And, uh, and here you see what is an artist rendition of an early solar system. And one of the things that we've learned from our astrophysics missions and our planetary science is that when solar systems form, when the cloud of gas from which our solar system formed uh, comes together, that planets and bits of planets, planetesimals, form almost at the same time as the star. And so these asteroids uh, are the results of collisions, of planets that never formed, really are primordial in the sense that they are the stuff that that the Earth was made out of, that the solar system's made out of. And there's actually a little animation running 
that shows you a model of a solar system forming, a planet forming around a star. The star's actually not turned on there. It's the dark spot in the middle. And it shows gaps opening up and, and planets forming. And in some of those gaps are leftover pieces, just like any construction project. You have lots of bits left over. Uh, and those are the asteroids. So they give us a sample of the primordial material. Uh, and sort of notionally shown in the bottom you know, are some pictures of uh, comets and asteroids. Uh, some asteroids may be dead comets. And we've been studying these for a long time. In fact, folks have been identifying uh, asteroids you know, for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Uh, we were thrilled to give uh, Tom Khalil a piece of Vesta. Uh, we know that because we've studied Vesta now in great detail, and the, and the piece that uh, we gave to, uh, to the White House today uh, has the same characteristics as Vesta, and Vesta is a little bit unique. Um, but we see asteroids that are iron, made of iron and nickel, you know, that would be at the core of, of a planet, for instance, like Earth, but also some asteroids that have a lot of water, some asteroids that have a lot of organic materials. And in the next slide, you'll see kind of a family portrait, not pictures from hundreds of years ago, or actually Vesta, which you can see with your naked eye if it's uh, close enough, um, but asteroids that we've actually gone to visit and take pictures of. Uh, these asteroids are relatively large for the most part, uh, tens, hundreds of kilometers across, and uh, it shows you kind of the variety, and they look a little bit beaten up. And that's because these asteroids have been around for billions of years, and they do collide. Uh, we see many asteroids that have moonlets, some of them may be from even recent collisions. Uh, and we have the main asteroid belt, of course, between Mars and Jupiter, where collisions happen frequently, sometimes knocking stuff into the inner solar system, uh, which we see go zipping by. And so these are our samples of the material from which the solar system formed. Uh, if you hit the, the next You'll see a, a very small one there, uh, which is going to zoom in. It's really not so small. It's uh, hundreds of meters, 500 meters across. And this is Itakawa, which we went and visited. And you'll see that it looks like a, a, a collection of stones. These are actually huge boulders, all stuck together with a lot of dust. Uh, and this looks like two asteroids which have collided and eventually uh, merged into one. Uh, and this is you know, an example of a potentially hazardous asteroid uh, that orbits similar to, to Earth uh, that we studied in, in some detail. Uh, I also told my kids that I was going to come today and talk about asteroids. Uh, and on uh, Father's Day, my daughter gave me actually a piece of a palisite uh, asteroid, which I have as a prop. Science guys like props. Uh, and this is uh, an iron nickel and olivine. It's a mineral, very, very common in early asteroids. Uh, this was from a 1,500 kilogram asteroid that landed in Argentina. Uh, probably nobody was around to see it then. Maybe the dinosaurs were. It was excavated on a farm. Uh, and so uh, my daughter's also very interested uh, in asteroids. So this is something that we've been studying in science for a long time. Next slide. Uh, so how do we find them? Well, we use observatories. We don't need particularly large telescopes, but not insignificant. Uh, we use the Catalina Sky Survey, the MIT Linear Telescope. Uh, a telescope called PanStars, and these are telescopes that are a couple of meters across, and they scan the sky at night, and so what you see in the middle are stars. They're fixed as the telescope tracks the night sky, and hopefully you saw a small object moving across the sky. Uh, here it is, and we then identify that as a moving object. We follow it up, and this was then determined to be an asteroid. These are then cataloged. We uh, sponsor the Minor Planet Center at Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Harvard uh, Smithsonian Observatory, and the Jet Propulsion Lab through our Near Earth Object Observation Program at the Jet Propulsion Lab. So this is how we, one way that we identify them. Next slide. We also use radars. Once we've identified one, we want to characterize it. Uh, so we, when, it comes, when some of these come near enough to the Earth, we can use the Goldstone radar to ping off of it. That gives us surface characteristics, and eventually we can build up a map. Uh, of the surface of the object and determine its rotation rate. Uh, an example is one that's uh, got the telephone numbers 1999 RQ36. It's been renamed Bennu. And this is going to be the target of the OSIRIS-REx mission. So in 2016, NASA is launching a mission in the from the Science Mission Directorate. Uh, Dante Lorento is the principal investigator at University of Arizona. We're going to send a mission out to an asteroid. It's going to orbit it, characterize it down to very small scales, millimeter scales, and then it's going to do a touch and go and bring back a sample in 2022 from Bennu. And this, these are our radar observations. We also use the Arecibo uh, Observatory in Puerto Rico. Next slide. 
So how are we doing on finding all of these uh, asteroids and potentially hazardous asteroids? Well, since 1998, when we really kicked up the gain on our study program, uh, we've identified many, many asteroids. And it shows uh, down there uh, on, on your right, uh, sorry, on your left, the uh, plot of the identification versus time. And you can see how uh, that spikes up starting around 1998. And that sh plot shows two different types, very large near-Earth asteroids and all near-Earth asteroids. If you want to know how complete is it, we have a model of what the size distribution of asteroids look like. Based on that model, we can say that we've found greater than 90% of all asteroids greater than a kilometer. Uh, between 300 meters and a kilometer, 60%. And it decreases from there. Part of the reason why we can't see uh, the smaller asteroids is we don't have the capability to do so, and part of it's nature. We can only see these small asteroids when they come close enough to the Earth to be bright enough for us to detect. Uh, another part of it is that the smaller the object, its orbit changes over time. And so maybe we see it once, but we can't confirm it because the next time it comes around, it's in a slightly different orbit. So there's a lot of challenges that nature presents, and these are some of the challenges we hope to solve in the future. Next slide. So how do we hope to do that? We're going to increase uh, with this proposal in the FY14 President's budget to, uh, to increase the study rate with the pan stars. We're also hoping to activate, reactivate the wide field uh, spectroscopic explorer, NEO-WISE, uh, which was turned into NEO-WISE, Near Earth Observatory-WISE. Uh, bring that back to life. It's uh, dormant right now. Uh, and also the Space Surveillance Telescope in uh, partnership with the United States Air Force. Once we find an object, we can characterize it. NASA has an infrared telescope facility on Mauna Kea, uh, also the Spitzer Space Telescope and other assets. Um, but that's not all. Fortunately, uh, asteroids are something that actually you can study with a rather large back backyard telescope, and many amateurs and many communities have those telescopes. Next slide. Uh, and so we want to engage uh, what we have called citizen science, which is really just amateur astronomers and, and pro-am astronomers who like to go out in their backyard at night and detect, uh, characterize through light curves, uh, discover new asteroids. And we also share data, for instance, PanSTARS data with the Isaacs uh, project, which is a consortium of universities that, that provide astronomical data from these large telescopes to amateurs uh, to study. And quite a large number of asteroids have actually been discovered or rediscovered and characterized by high school students. And there's one shown on the left who is a, a, a local Virginia student who won an American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Science Fair project by discovering uh, with his partners a number of asteroids and, and characterizing some others. Uh, so that's sort of the why and the how. And I'll turn it over to Mike Gazarek uh, to talk about the technology that we'll use. Uh, thanks, John. Well, I didn't bring uh, an example of high power solar electric propulsion with me today, <laughs> which is probably good for all of us. Uh, but let me talk about that if I can have the next slide. And uh, let me talk a little bit about space technology and the technologies that we're working on. And again, we can have the next slide. Um, so just, just a brief you know, context setting. Uh, we know to, to explore deep space, and this is what, what this mission is an example of, we need a number of technologies. These are not new. In fact, many of you in this room I know have worked on many reports over 30 years talking about the technologies we need to explore deep space. And they come in a variety of challenges. They're listed here. Today, of course, I want to focus on propulsion, in particular, high power solar electric propulsion. So let's go to the next chart. Solar electric propulsion is not new. Uh, it's been around for uh, a number of years, starting with Deep Space One, again, a science mission using solar electric propulsion to navigate and move through the solar system. And then particularly Dawn, uh, as, as, we, as we had examples of it today, of, of visiting the asteroids uh, that it's going to, using, again, was a really novel use of solar electric propulsion. In fact, uh, there was a number of technology developments prior to that mission that really enabled the use of Dawn to use solar electric propulsion. Well, since that point in time, solar electric propulsion now is used by industry for commercial spacecraft. In fact, Boeing has an all-electric spacecraft. Um, but in particular, on this chart, the AEH, AEHF uh, satellite, uh, many of you may have followed in the news. Um, the upper stage didn't quite work out as well. It couldn't get to its orbit. And they use a very novel application of the solar electric thrusters that are on board that spacecraft to get it into its orbit. This is a multi-billion dollar satellite that would have been lost had it not been for the, av for, for the use, the knowledge, the technology for solar electric propulsion. And so that's really where we are today. The next step, high power. 
uh, for uh, not only NASA to do this mission uh, in the, it's called the 50 kilowatt range, but, but also for future missions. Uh, coming out of uh, architecture studies, and there, again, there are many of them, high power solar electric propulsion, the ability to move cargo uh, to destinations that we intend to go, right, is an enabler, an incredibly mass saver in, in terms of getting the, the infrastructure that we need to explore uh, the solar system. That is not new. Uh, and it is time, uh, after many years of reports, to go invest in this technology. Industry has come to us and said multiple times, w w you know, there's risk involved at the high power level. Can the government address those risks, enabling a whole host of opportunities that I'll talk to in a minute? It, it's not only NASA. Uh, the, the, the House Armed Services Committee, just in a recent report, recommended that the Air Force get together with NRO and NASA to get together and, and look at the investments in technology for high power solar electric propulsion. Let's go to the next chart. Today, when we, when we look at, at solar electric propulsion, we break it down into these three main subsystems. And I won't go uh, through you into details, although I, I love to be in the tech guy. Um, but, but the main components are solar arrays, the ability to collect the sun's energy that we need, right, to, to turn into propulsion. The electronics and the thrusters, kind of the sexy part of this. And then the propellant system, the, to store the, uh, the material, the xenon that we use for propulsion. It, it turns out if you look at high power today, the real trick, the real long pole in the tent is in the arrays. We just can't collect enough energy. We need larger arrays. And if you need larger arrays that have to fit in today's rocket shrouds, they have to be deployable. They have to be able to fold up. We are pushing on packaging densities and power per mass ratios, factors of two, four, even up to six times what's over the state of the art today. We need these large arrays. They have to unfurl, and they need to be, be able to pack into the volume of the shroud. And that's where we have investments already started today in space technology in these large-scale uh, solar arrays. If we go to the next chart. So as I mentioned before, high-power solar electric is not only for this mission that we're talking about today, but it's also for a whole host of applications, both industrial and other government agencies, and with our international partners. This, this is uh, uh, high-power solar electric is, is called out by the NRC, one of the tipping point technologies. Right, that enables a whole host of applications, including not only human exploration, as we discussed, satellite servicing. We talked about payload delivery and the ability, for example, to, to rescue AEHF to get us to its orbit. Uh, use on station, future robotic missions above and beyond what we see on dawn, orbitable de debris removal, and, and other uh, applications as shown there. So high power, high power solar electric propulsion is a technology that's needed by many. It's needed by NASA. It is time to develop it. And that's what we do in, in space tech. We, we develop technology with a purpose, and this is just a great example of that. So that's, what, that's where we are for solar electric propulsion. I'm going to now turn it over to Bill. We'll hear more about the mission and hear more about the RFI. Thanks, Mike. Um, if I can have my next slide, please. As John talked about, he, he described the observation, the identified piece. Then Mike talked a little bit about the electric propulsion and some of the technology. What I'll talk about now is a little bit the redirect mission itself, and then I'll talk about how that mission fits into our overall human exploration plans going forward in the future. So next slide. So this is the asteroid redirect segment reference concept that, that we've put together. Uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to capture and redirect a 7 to 10 meter, uh, approximately 500 ton near Earth asteroid to a stable orbit in translunar space, probably a deep retrograde orbit around the moon. Um, and this will enable an astronaut mission to the asteroid as early as 2021, around the time of the EM2 mission that we've currently planned with Orion and SLS. And we see this as a forward and, and kind of parallel uh, approach. In other words, we'll be doing some of the observations that John described earlier at the same time we're actually building the hardware for the mission. So we won't fully have identified the target we're going to go to when we potentially, uh, bef while we're actually building the spacecraft. So we'll build the spacecraft and a capture device to a set of generic capabilities, a generic set of specifications. And then once we finally identified the target that we really want to go to, to, to grab onto and redirect, then we'll go launch in that direction. Next chart. So a little bit about what this involves. We took a, essentially a candidate target 2009 BD. Uh, we, we took a look at what it would take to actually put this mission together. And you can see on, uh, on your left the trajectory to the asteroid. You can see it takes about 1.84 years to get there. That's a function of what launch vehicle it comes off of. If it comes off of an SLS or a Falcon 9 Heavy or a Delta IV, with uh, lots of uh, uh, essentially initial thrust, then the, the transit time is about what you see on this chart. 
If we take a smaller rocket and launch with that, then we'll spiral out using electric propulsion, and that will take significant longer to get out to the object. But you can see that it's not trivial to get out there. It's the 671 days time of flight out to get out to the object. Then we essentially attach to the object in, in the, the uh, picture on the right, and then we essentially redirect, and we say redirect rather than to bring back, and, and we say that purposely because the object is already in an orbit that brings it back to the vicinity of the moon and the Earth. So we, we take advantage of the fact it's already coming back so we don't have to change velocity in that direction. All we need to do is essentially redirect it such we can use the Earth's gravity, use the lunar gravity to add some more delta velocity to this object in the spacecraft, and then we can put it into a deep retrograde orbit around the moon. And that orbit is intriguing because it's essentially stable with no propellant, uh, no attitude control, no orbital maintenance for up to maybe 100 years. So once we get the spacecraft and the object in this orbit, it's there for us to go visit multiple times in the future. And again, this is kind of our reference concept. Again, I would take these, you know, this is just a target we picked just to make sure from a feasibility standpoint this could work and make sure we understand the delta velocities, et cetera. Next chart. We're also looking at some alternatives. Maybe there's some different techniques that may be good to go look at. We're requesting these ideas through this RFI that's been released. You know, one additional concept study is to take a look at maybe take go to, out to a larger near-Earth asteroid. You know, John showed you a picture of, uh, of one of the objects that was very large with a large number of boulders on the surface of it. So maybe instead of going out to a small asteroid, which are tough to track for the reasons that John described earlier, maybe we go to a large asteroid, a couple hundred kilometers potentially, maybe tens of kilometers, and then we can actually then maybe push on that object see if we can put a delta velocity change in it on the order of millimeters per second, extremely small change in delta velocity, but that small velocity applied early enough could be the velocity that deflects this object away from the Earth, and we could actually then prove that the concept of actually pushing on one of these large objects is actually effective and actually works. Then we would come off the object, we would go survey it, find a boulder that looks appropriate for the capture device we have and then, then grab that boulder off the surface and then do the same redirect that I described earlier. So this is one thing we've been, been thinking about it, and we'll, we're looking for other ideas as you, as you comment to the RFI. Think of other ways we can, we can make these ties more real to other objectives, other programs with us. We look to the creativity that you have here in this audience to help us figure out ways to do this in a slightly a different manner. The other thing you'll notice on here is that when we do this, because we spent a significant amount of, of delta velocity pushing on this large object, the, the size of the object we can bring back is now smaller. So you can see on this chart, we'd bring back something on the order of one to 10 meters. So we, so we recognize that when we, we redirect or bring this object back into this deep retrograde orbit, it'll be smaller in this case. But it, but it gives you a, essentially a real world example of pushing on a larger object. Next. Again, a little bit more about the, the mission in, in picture form here. You, you can see the, uh, the, this is the crewed mission portion where we would use the SLS to, to launch the crew out to this deep retrograde orbit. We can do that with no changes to the SLS vehicle. It, its initial configuration, the 70 metric ton SLS, works fine in this, uh, this capability. The Orion spacecraft is compatible with this mission. Um, it was designed to have spacewalks out of, the, uh, out of the Orion capsule, so we can go do a spacewalk out of the capsule. Um, the basic stay time in this deep retrograde orbit is compatible with what we wanted to go do. Um, so it, it essentially fits right with what we were doing already. So as we described earlier, you know, this whole mission activity captures a lot what we were doing before. It captures the observation things that John was working on. It was captures the electric propulsion that, that Mike was working on. And it captures and utilizes our Orion and SLS just as it was envisioned. So in a very nice sense, it ties the three directorates very closely together into a nice integrated mission that gives us a, a pretty interesting thing to do in, in deep space. Next. This is what the... the uh, profile or the, uh, the rendezvous looks like with Orion out to this object. Uh, you can see we, we leave Earth and we do a lunar gravity assist around the moon to end up in this retrograde orbit. We'll essentially stay in this deep retrograde orbit for roughly five days. Uh, during that time, we believe we can do two spacewalks out of the Orion, and those would be about four hours duration uh, each. And that allows us to do fairly simple spacewalks to go out to, to grab a piece of the the asteroid to then be returned in the Orion capsules, it comes back. 
the, the good thing about this is it's actually given us an experience of operating in deep space. It's allowing us on the human side to start using lunar gravity assist, which we think is an important tool to us to, to get to these regions. And it also puts us in a situation where once we're out on this deep retrograde orbit, we're committed to be there for three or four days before we can actually get the crew back to the Earth. So this gives us some experience of, of, not, of operating in a different regime than where we operate today with Space Station. In the case of Space Station, if the crew has a problem or the spacecraft has a problem, we can be home in a matter of hours. In this case, we're going to have to make sure we have the right uh, abort scenarios, the right redundancy in place that we can tolerate being in this situation for up to five days. So that helps us take a step towards the, the bigger missions that we want to do going forward. Next chart. <clears throat> again, this is a little more detail on the spacewalk. Uh, and again, in the RFI, we're asking for some suggestions for you on, on other ways we might do this. We show conceptually what we would do. You'll notice here we didn't dock to the robotic spacecraft. We used a little uh, robotic arm. That arm is designed or, or is the concept is off of the robonaut that's on board space station. So we're repurposing, again, components we have in other areas to be used there. We'll look to you to give us other ideas and suggestions on how we ought to do this. You see us using a Strela kind of boom, a Russian type of boom, or, or to get over to the uh, robotic spacecraft and then to get out to the asteroid itself. Again, we're looking for ideas and concepts from you about better ways to do this, more efficient ways, things that will actually feed forward to other missions we'll want to do in exploration, want to do in deep space. So we look to you to, to take the vision of this is one mission, but it's really that first step that's going to allow us to get humans beyond low Earth orbit, to push further out into the universe. And we look for you to help us figure out ways to connect those dots to make effective use of this mission so it feeds forward to those other bigger destinations and things we want to go do. Next. This is the capability-driven framework, kind of what I was alluding to before. You know, we see this where we do things on Space Station today. It's a very good microgravity platform. It's excellent for us to learn about astronaut health for long durations in space. It's also good to check out spacesuits. We'll use the spacesuits for this mission on the uh, ISS probably initially, so, that, so it's there. It's a tremendous research facility. It's kind of our first, our, our first foothold in, in low Earth orbit. Then you're going to see us move out uh, beyond low Earth orbit. This region around the moon is very intriguing to us. This deep retrograde orbit is, is interesting. It, it provides uh, some, some neat things for us to, to get a chance to not only be there to pick up this, this sample, but we can also observe the moon. We can see some things on the other side of the moon, which we would not typically get from other orbits. We can also transition from this orbit to Lagrangian points. We can other maneuver around to low, low lunar orbit, et cetera. So this is, again, a stepping stone that gives us experience, gains us knowledge as we move forward. And, and our ultimate goal is to get to Mars. And you can see each one of these steps as you move further and further out requires more and more capability for us, both from a technology standpoint, but also in a, just an operational preparedness standpoint. Next. You know, one thing I think that's important is that this mission is, is a mission itself, but it also ties directly into the long-term uh, human Mars exploration strategy. Uh, again, we're using the, the, the Orion vehicle, the SLS vehicle. Um, we, we get this electric propulsion capability, which we think has tremendous potential for us. This mission would not be possible if we didn't have electric propulsion. The amount of delta velocity that we need to impart to even redirect this asteroid would not be possible with chemical propulsion. It requires electric propulsion. As we position cargo for Mars missions and those kind of classes of missions, we're going to clearly want to use the same type of electric propulsion. So it fits as we move forward. I talked about operations and risk management. We think that's important. Communications, to understand operating in not a perfect communications environment, we're going to have to do that as we, we push out. And we'll also get a chance to look at sample acquisition, caching, storing operations that will fit as we go forward. Uh, we also get to work and interact with the planetary body, which we think is also tremendously important as we, as we start getting ready to go out to the moon, or go, excuse me, go out to Mars, or go out to potentially a moon of Mars. Those same kind of things that we're doing with this robotic spacecraft and this sample fit, and they all move forward. So this is a great mission that keeps us moving forward, keeps pushing human exploration in the right direction. Next. So this is another graphic kind of of the way we see us advancing from where we are today with the International Space Station. You can see on here the, the transit times. You know, we're essentially maybe two days on Space Station away, actually hours. Moon is three to seven days, depending on, on where we're going. The Lagrangian points are a little bit further. 
And then obviously Mars is this six to nine month kind of activity, which is, which is a pretty demanding thing. So the idea is to really build the technology, build the operational concepts, build the hardware that allows us to continue to keep pushing out. Next. And so again, what we're asking for you today is you know, the request for information is out there. We're asking for you to think about concepts and different approaches than maybe what we've described here. We've given you some reference ideas. We've given you one permutation of that reference idea, but we want you to think about other ways of enhancing this to get the most out of it. So we're looking for things on, on asteroid observation that John can use to in, improve that activity. We're looking for some redirection systems discussions that might fit into Mike's area. Some deflection demonstrations, do those make sense? How can we you know, increase our learning from that? Asteroid capture systems, those are going to be unique to capture this device and to de-spin it. We need some, some help in understanding those, some crew systems, and then partnerships and participatory engagement. We, so we're looking for all these comments to these things to help us get a better system. And, and this RFI is open to all organizations, including industry, universities, nonprofit organizations, NASA centers, FFRDCs, and other government agencies and international organizations. So I don't think there's anybody else I could put down at the bottom. I think we've included everybody, and so, uh, so, so we're looking for your comments and we're looking for your suggestions. Next. And I think uh, Robert's got one chart that'll be coming up here somewhere. Yeah, so what, we, what I thought I'd do is kind of, so how does all this come together? At what, at what point, how do, we, how do we pull that together? So if I can get the next chart, <coughs> as soon as it comes up, we're gonna, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start taking the information today. Today, today is a pretty important day for us to get all you engaged in, in your, get your, start to get your thoughts into our planning. We have, uh, as, as Gersh talked about, we've got a lot of information that we want to get from the RFI. We'll see how that, how that works and that, that release comes out today. We've got the Target NEO2 workshop coming up in July. It's another opportunity for us to, to engage with the uh, Small Bodies Assessment Group um, and get, get some ideas from that, that, that area as well some of the ch and talk about some of the challenges, as John discussed again, with the identification and characterization of these smaller smaller uh, asteroids that we've got to go deal with. We're looking for a, a pretty interactive process between now and July 18th when we, we expect the response from, from everybody on the, on the RFI. July 30th is our internal uh, mission formulation review. And, and this is gonna be specifically related to the design reference mission that, that, that Gers talked about a minute ago, the, that mission. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the, what, what's, the, what's the pursuit of the overall mission. We're gonna look for mission success criteria. We're gonna look for how does the, what kind of content do we need to put into our budget process as we move forward with, with our budget cycle. We still have that to, to do as well as, um, as we move forward. Content, structure, center participation, um, where, where, where's the right expertise located within the agency? So far it's been a tremendous multi-center team that's been pulling this together. Um, you know, and, and we really do, we're getting, the right, we're getting the best folks working on this in the agency. And we got to start talking about that. Talk about our make, it, make or buy planning. This is a pretty important step for us in terms of, you know, if, is this something that we can buy, depending on what the pieces are. We'll do that in July. In September, we'll, we'll kind of bring it all together. We'll have, we will have finished the, uh, the mission formulation review. We'll be getting the responses in from the RFI, and we'll be able to kind of piece it all together and, and, and start going down the path toward what is more, uh, a more traditional mission concept review so that we can see where we can add pieces in that you guys have brought forward. We can piece together what we've learned with the mission formulation review. Um, and, and so that September time frame is going to be really important for us for, for kind of really tying down what the mission is going to look like, um, what alternatives we still want to pursue, what areas we want to go after, and also starting to get some more refined input into the budget process. So a pretty busy next three months for us as uh, we get going, and that'll all lead toward a mission concept review probably somewhere around the first of the year is when we'll start getting into that arena. So. That's the path forward, and uh, appreciate what these guys have shared with you. They've done a good job kind of laying out what we've been working on for the last couple of months, um, actually for several years, actually. I think the last couple of months, we've just kind of got it to coalesce.